Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is linear algebra. Today, the topic are the traces, the traces of matrices. And I kind of claim, um, as we can read it here, it's kind of the best matrix invariant. Best, of course, is a question mark because, well, there is a good way of measuring anything. Um, the, the reason why I would like to call it the best is because it's ridiculously simple. So it works as follows. So here you have a matrix. So um, whatever, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah. Um, and the trace of the matrix in its very explicit incarnation is just the sum of the diagonal elements. Right? You have this green entry one, the first diagonal and, uh, entry, you have this uh, red entry five, second diagonal entry, and you have the purple entry nine, uh, third diagonal entry, you just sum them up. And one plus five plus nine is the trace and it's 50. Just a number that you get from a matrix. You have a huge matrix, you can compute the trace. Um, note that this is way easier than anything else you can basically say about matrices. You just look along the diagonal and you sum up the entries you see. It's very easy. A computer can do that in, in a blink of an eye. Very, very quick. Um, okay, in this definition, which is probably the one you will use in practice, but um, in this definition, it's not quite clear why this should be in any way interesting. You could also take the sum of the whatever, the, the, these diag anti diagonal elements. Why not? Or some other crazy sums in, in your matrix. And in some sense, this is more the the one you should keep in mind, of course, but um, just explicit incarnation of a, of, a, of a much better definition. So um, kind of the best definition is the one below here, but uh, let's do a, an intermediate step. So let's define the trace as the sum of the eigenvalues in contrast to the determinant, which is a product of the eigenvalues. For the determinant, well, if you define it as a product of the eigenvalues, it's kind of clear that it is uh, invariant under, under base change because the eigenvalues are invariant under base change. But it's not so quite clear how to compute it. Same as you would define the trace as the sum of the eigenvalues. Sure, that's an invariant, it's invariant under base change. But from here to here is not a completely trivial operation. It's not super hard, I'm not saying that, but it's certainly not trivial. But um, the middle, so this definition looks way more like a definition, like a definition should look like. It's, it's kind of clear why this should be interesting. The abstract way of formulating things is a below one. So trace is kind of the unique linear operator satisfying, well, that it's so from matrices to the ground field, satisfying that it's linear and the most important property of all, the cyclicity property. So the trace, and I will give you a diagrammatic interpretation of that later. But the trace of AB, that's what you should remember. So you have two matrices, you can multiply them uh, and you, the trace is cyclic. So it's a trace of A, B, uh, B, A. And this is really, really an important property of the trace. Um, it follows from this property, but let me just stress it, why this is called actually cyclic. Because if you now have trace from A, B, C, Right. What you can do is you can you can take and you will see an as I said a diagrammatic interpretation later and then it becomes everything becomes clear. But you could put C in front, for example, so you can move it around, move it around the circle. That's why it's called cyclic. So it's A C A B and so on for any length of matrices whatsoever. So what do do we need to remember about the matrix uh, about the trace? Well, first of all, it's super easy to compute. It is the sum of the diagonal elements, and that's easy. But it's kind of a silly definition because, okay, why not take any other sum? Mm. Um, the better definition is the trace of a matrix is the sum of the eigenvalues. It's, well, by now we have accepted that eigenvalues are kind of nice. Um, so yeah, that looks like a reasonable definition and it kind of makes sense because, well, the determinant is kind of the product of the eigenvalues, right? So why not? Um, and the last one is might be a little bit mysterious. Why this should be interesting? Sure, we want a linear operator. That makes sense. 
Um, but the cyclicity is a bit strange. But the point is this nails down the trace up to the scalar. So this is uniquely determines the, the trace. The trace is a unique up to a scalar, of course, uh, linear map satisfying cyclicity, which tells you that this property is crucial. Okay. Um, so what to do with traces? So basically traces generalizes them, generalize dimensions in the following way. So of course, if you write down the identity matrix, so let's see here's my three by three identity matrix. Um, and let's say with real entries here. And of course the trace is just the sum of three ones. So it's just a dimension of R three. Similarly, if you have some kind of a projection matrix, which just means you have a zero entry here. Um, and yeah, let's say you have two entries here, then the trace is just one plus one. So it's just the dimension of the target. And in general, whenever you have a matrix satisfying this property, this is called a projection. Okay, like, like this matrix here, um, you can calculate it as A square actually is A. Um, then it's a projection and geometrically, it's exactly what you think it does. It, it projects a vector uh, down to a, to, to a potentially smaller subspace. And how can you figure out the dimension of the subspace? Well, you compute the trace. So in this case, the trace is, as you can see, it's two and it's exactly, uh, well, the dimension of R squared and also the dimension of the image of R, A. So it's the image of A. Okay, so it, it tells you kind of the dimension of the target and after projection. In that sense, dimensions generalize, uh, dimen traces generalize dimensions. That's how you should think about it, traces generalize dimension. And again, as a generalization of dimension, it then makes sense, oh yeah, it makes sense to study it. In, in the first formulation, it's kind of mysterious why you should study it, but as a generalization of dimensions, that's good. So now I hope I gave you enough reasons to believe that trace is a uh, reasonable definition. So let me show you a fun example, a uh, fun application. So traces are so important in mathematics and beyond everything that involves some linear algebra because they are so easy and still encode enough information about your matrix. So here's a fun example. So you can start with a graph, here's a graph. Um, so it has five vertices and you can associate to it its adjacency matrix. That's a very easy way um, and it works as follows. So give your graphs vertices some, some names. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. So I get a five by five matrix. And I just label the rows one, two, three, four, five, and one, two, three, four. And then I just put in an entry whenever there's an edge between the two vertices. Right? So from one to two, I have an edge. So I put a label here and I have also an edge from two to one. So I put a label here and so on. And you fill it up and you get a matrix. Right? In this example, there is, for example, no edge from three to three, so you get a zero, but there is an edge from three to four, so you get a one and so on. Okay. So you get this matrix. And it's kind of a cool idea to associate a, a matrix to a graph because now you can use linear algebra to attack problems in, in, in combinatorics and in graph theory and discrete mathematics, right? And the, the question that is now very easy to answer in general, it's very surprising that it's so easy, but um, how many triangles actually does a graph have? So this, everything I say works in general, but let's stay with this graph. So how many triangles can you see? So I see, for example, here's a triangle. So a triangle is just a path of length three that, um, well, it's a triangle, right? That you start somewhere, you go, you go uh, three steps and you're back to where you started. So here, for example, is a triangle. And now you want to count the number of those triangles. For, for this graph, of course, you can just do it. The number is 10, okay? But in general, that might not be super easy because the graph might be horribly huge and complicated. Nobody, nobody knows. Um, but you can make the following funny calculation. You can take the, the, uh, the cube of your matrix, right? You know, if your matrix, you can cube it, no problem. You get some result. Well, it's written up here, it doesn't really matter. Compute its trace. So the trace of the cube is 60. 
Okay, that's a bit funny, but you kind of overcount it a little bit. So you get rid of six. So trace divided by six is 10, and that's exactly the number of triangles in this graph. Okay, can, can we count them? Well, this green triangle appears five times. It's here, then it's here again. So five times just rotated, then it's here, and then it's here. Okay, so the green triangle appears five, so we get five. And there's also um, this triangle, the orange one, which also has a five symmetry, so it also appears five times. And indeed, you can count in this graph, you have 10 triangles. But instead of counting, you could have just taken the third power of the matrix and divide the trace by six. Dividing by six is a trivial operation. Taking the trace is a trivial operation or very easy operation. And taking the third power is also a very easy operation. So this is much more useful in practice than just look at your graph and try to count the number of triangles. And this is just the, 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 the tip of the iceberg, right? This is just a really, really easy application of traces. So traces are cool <laughs> and they appear everywhere and they're easy. Um, the, the complete, the formal statement is then the trace is kind of the, the unique map. So here it doesn't really matter that I work with the, the real numbers, which you can, you can do that for any, for any field, but anyway. So the trace is a unique map, which is linear and cyclic. The cyclicity property is extremely, extremely important. And yeah, it generalizes dimensions and you can show that is actually the sum of the eigenvalues and you can show that the definition above is, uh, uh, gives the implicit, uh, explicit incarnation of the, of the trace as the sum of the diagonal elements. And by cyclicity, it's a fun calculation, a very short one. So uh, base change means P, A, P inverse for some invertible matrix P. And by cyclicity, you can, for example, put the, pull the P in the back and then you can console those out. So traces stay, um, they're they invariant under, under base change. So it's an invariant of the matrix. Again, a super easy one because you have this property and they are still reasonably interesting because they encode something about eigenvalues in a non-trivial way. Okay, so traces are cool and easy and basically you always try to use some some, some traces um, until it doesn't work anymore because of course you lose some information about your matrix. It's, it's a very easy invariant, still a very powerful. It's kind of the first non-trivial invariant that you can write down for a matrix. Um, and why actually is this called a cyclic property? Well, so this picture generalizes beyond matrices. So the, the point of a trace in some sense in the end is that it is useful and generalizes. And the, the way it generalizes is as follows. I think of my matrix as, as a box, which has an input comes in and has an output goes out, okay? And I, I think of my ground field as being an empty diagram, an empty diagram. So how can I go from a box to an empty diagram from here to here? So how does it work? Well. There's one operation I can think of, I can just close it off. And that's my picture for the trace. So this is my trace. Okay, the picture for the trace is just a circle, a circle with labels and each label is a matrix. And then the cyclicity property is extremely easy to see. It's just, okay, um, you have A times B. Okay, now you take B, you take B, you pull it around Right, it ends up here and you pull it even further and then it ends up here. Uh, so this is B times A. And that's why it's called cyclic. You really just pull matrices around the circle in this picture. And this hasn't used actually any properties about matrices at all. That's why it, it generalizes. But um, uh, for, for linear algebra, it's just a, a really nice way of thinking about traces. Like why they have, well, what the cyclicity property actually encodes. It encodes that your trace is a, is a circle and you can pull things around the circle. Um, anyway, so uh, traces are one of my favorite uh, tools in linear algebra. They're super easy, they're invariants of matrices. Uh, and 
really, they're, they're really good. They're easy to compute, applicable to many situations, and ge they generalize beyond the realm of matrices. Um, yeah, so I hope you enjoyed the video and I hope to see you next time.